Hello everyone, welcome to Calculus Lecture 7. And today we'll continue working with integrals. So we'll do some practice problems with indefinite integrals. And then we're going to start talking about definite integrals. And so we're going to talk about Riemann sums and then the fundamental theorem of calculus. So before we get started, let's just do a couple of quick review problems. So remember the uh, integral version of the power rule from last time. So the integral of x to the n dx is equal to x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. And this is for any n not equal to minus 1. If n is minus 1, we'd be dividing by 0, so that wouldn't be allowed. But any other n is fine. It doesn't even have to be an integer. Um, it certainly doesn't have to be positive. And always remember the plus c because an antiderivative can always differ by a constant. So here's some quick review problems. So evaluate the following. The integral of 5x to the fourth dx the integral of 3t squared dt, the integral of 2x dx, and finally the integral of 4 dt, just the number. So see if you can solve these on your own, and I'll give the answer in just a moment. All right, so let's do this. So the first one, five x to the fourth, the five stays where it is. We can always keep a constant without doing anything to it. And then the x to the four using this formula will become x to the five over five. So that's five x to the five over five. And then the fives cancel. So we're just left with x to the five plus c. All right, for three t squared, it's similar. We keep the 3 where it is, so that's 3, and then the t squared becomes t cubed over 3 from this formula again. So that's 3t cubed over 3, and then the 3s cancel, and we're just left with t cubed plus c. All right, then for 2x dx, we're doing the same thing. We keep the 2. Remember, this x is x to the 1. So this becomes an x squared over 2. The 2s cancel, and we're left with x squared. And then finally, the 4 dt, that's 4t uh, to the 0. We can think of it that way. And then using the formula, we're left with 4t. Remember that the integral of a constant will always look like this. So the integral, if k is any constant, so we have the integral of k dt or dx, whatever it is, this integral will always be equal to kt plus c. So you're just multiplying by the variable. That's true for any constant. And in general, of course, we know that if we have a constant here, so multiplied by everything inside the integral, we can pull it out of the integral. So for example, this integral of 5x to the fourth dx we can make it the uh, five times the integral of x to the fourth dx. So any constant that's multiplied by the entire integral, we can just pull out like that. And sometimes that'll help make it simpler if we're working with something complicated and just don't wanna have to deal with those constants. So for example, let's do a couple of these for practice. So let's say we have the integral of five sine x dx. the integral of one half e to the t dt, the integral of three t squared dt, and finally the integral of five dx. So try and solve these, and try and solve these by first pulling the constant out of the integral and then solving the integral, just to see that you can do it both ways. Okay. 
All right, so for the first one, five sine x dx, we're gonna pull the five out. So that's gonna be five times the integral of sine x dx. And so that's gonna be five times, well, what's the antiderivative of sine x? Well, the derivative of cosine x is negative sine x. So the derivative of negative cosine x is sine x. So that's going to be 5 times negative cosine x plus c. And so remember, we don't actually have to multiply the 5 by the constant because c can be anything. It's allowed to be any number. So it doesn't matter if there's a constant multiplied by it. It just absorbs all the constants that could possibly be added. All right, for the second one, we're going to pull the 1 half out. So this is equal to 1 half times the integral of e to the t dt. And we know this is just e to the t. So this is 1 half times e to the t plus c. For 3t squared, we already knew how to do this, but we can also do it by pulling the 3 out. So that's 3 times the integral of t squared dt. And using the formula for the power rule, this is equal to 3 times t cubed over 3 which is just t cubed plus c. And then finally, for the constant 5, we know from the formula above, um, this formula here, that this integral is just going to be equal to 5x plus c. The other thing we can do is take the integral of a sum. So if we do take the integral of some sum f of x plus g of x, so that's going to look like the integral of f of x plus g of x dx. We can split that. So that's going to be equal to the integral of f of x dx plus the integral of g of x dx. So as an example, say we're taking the integral of 2 plus e to the x plus sine x dx. Now we can split this. So this is going to be equal to the integral of 2 dx plus the integral of e to the x dx plus the integral of sine x dx. All right, now we can solve this. So the integral of 2 dx, this is equal to 2x. We know that. The integral of e to the x dx is just e to the x. We know that as well. And the integral of sine x dx is negative cosine x. So we're just going to add that on as well. And then we still have our plus c. Now, in theory, we would have needed to add the plus c to every term. But they're all just any constant, and they can be any constant. So again, we just need to add it one time at the end of the final answer, because this can absorb any constant we could add to any of the integrals. So let's do one more for practice. Let's do the integral of 3s squared plus 5s plus 3e to the s plus 4ds. And you can split the sum like this, or you can just do it directly term by term. It's the same thing. You don't necessarily need to rewrite it as multiple integrals. So that's up to you. All right, so let's do this. So once we split the integral, we have the integral of 3s squared ds plus the integral of 5s ds plus the integral of 3e to the s ds plus the integral of 4 ds. So now let's solve these term by term. So 3s squared becomes 3 times s cubed over 3. And we'll simplify that in the next step. All right, plus the 5 stays. And then the s over here becomes s squared over 2. Still from the power rule. Now the 3e to the s, that's just going to be what it is. 
because e to the s is its own derivative. So this is a plus 3e e to the s. And then plus the uh, integral of 4 is just 4s. And then we add our plus c. And then once we simplify this, this these threes cancel. So that's s cubed plus 5 halves s squared plus 3e e to the s plus 4s plus c. And that's going to be our final answer. And you could have even in at this point pulled the constants out um, and instead possibly put the three over here, over here, the five over here, if that's easier. You don't have to do that, but you can. In this step, you couldn't directly have pulled the constants out because every term has a different constant. You're only allowed to pull the constant out if it's multiplied by every term in the integral. The other important integral to keep in mind, uh, we know that the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. And what that means is that the integral of 1 over x, or x to the minus 1, remember how the power rule didn't work for minus 1, is the natural log of x. So as an example, we could do the integral of 2 over x dx. Well, we can pull the constant out like we just learned. So this is equal to 2 times the integral of 1 over x dx, which is 2 times the natural log of x plus c. Uh, as another example, let's do this one. Let's do the integral of 3 over x plus 3e e to the x dx. See if you can solve this. I'll pause for a moment. All right, so let's split this integral. So this is going to be equal to the integral of 3 over x dx plus the integral of 3e e to the x dx. And now in the next step, we can also pull the constants out. So this is 3 times the integral of 1 over x dx plus 3 times the integral of e to the x dx. And now we know this is the natural log of x. So now we have 3 times the natural log of x plus 3 times e to the x. And then we just have our single plus c at the end. So that's going to be the answer. Now, that's it for practice with indefinite integrals for now. We're going to get to some other techniques later when we start talking about use substitution and operation by parts. But for now, let's talk about the definite integral. So what the definite integral is, is we're given a graph of a function and usually two points. Sometimes we'll have uh, indefinite bounds and it'll go to infinity, but usually we're just given two points. And then we want to find the area between the graph and the x-axis, so the area of this region. So there are multiple ways to do this. Eventually, we're going to learn the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we're going to be able to use that and indefinite in integrals to help us find this area. The other thing we can do is what's called a Riemann sum, or sometimes called a Darboux sum. So either Riemann or Darboux. This will depend on your teacher. And the way we would do this is we would have our function and then we would take this area that we want to find the area of and break it into rectangles. And then we can find the area of these rectangles. And then we can make the rectangles smaller and smaller and find the limit. So we would add up the areas of all these rectangles. And then we would make them thinner and thinner so they get as close to the function as possible and take the limit of those so we're approximating the function really, really well. And so that's one way to find the integral, and then we're going to learn the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's first do an example with this. So with the Riemann sum. So 
one thing we can do, let's say we have the function f of x equals x squared. And we want to find the area between 0 and 1. So let's say that's 1. So this is the point 1, 1. And we want to find this area. So how are we going to do it? Well, right now, we're going to break this into rectangles. So something like this. It's not perfect, but the idea is it gets closer and closer and it gets arbitrarily close to the actual answer. So firstly, the notation for this area is we still use this integral sign and then we actually put our bounds uh, below and above. And then we still have our function f of x dx. And then these bounds tell us that we're not looking for the indefinite integral, we're actually finding this area. So anytime you're told to find the area under the curve, this is what you're looking for. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, we can uh, take a Riemann sum. And so basically the idea is if we split this into n parts and add up all the rectangles, say where the height of the rectangle is whatever the left endpoint is. And you could choose the right endpoint or the middle point, whichever one you prefer. It's all going to be the same as long as you're working with a continuous function. So let's see. So if we break this into n parts, then we're going to be summing up. We have a sum from n equals one, uh, sorry. Let's go from i equals one to n. And so we're gonna be making n larger and larger eventually. And what's the sum gonna be? Firstly, we want the width of each rectangle and we're gonna make the rectangles even. So the width of each rectangle is going to be 1 over n times the height of the rectangle. And what's the height of the rectangle? Well, at each point, we are going to have uh, this value here. The x value is going to be um, i over n. So we're going to start from 1 over n, and then 2 over n, and 3 over n, and so on. So if I want to do uh this in particular is doing a right sum because I'm starting from i equal to 1. So I'm starting here. I could also start from i equal to 0 and do a left sum. So I'm just going to keep this as is. So now the height of the rectangle is going to be whatever I, happens when I apply the function to i over n, which is the x value. So in this case, that's going to be i over n squared. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit of this as x approach as n approaches infinity. And that's going to give us this integral. So let's see what we can do with this limit. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n. The 1 over n stays, and I'm going to in fact just pull this out of the limit, uh, times i over n squared. So that's just going to be i squared over n squared. In fact, I can even pull this n squared out. So that's going to be the limit uh, because n is constant in this sum. So uh, that's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i squared. Now, what is this? This is a standard formula that you do not need to memorize, but sometimes it's good to know. You'll almost certainly be given this one test if you need it. But in any case, this is going to in fact be equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. You can verify this by induction if you need to. You won't usually be asked to figure it out, though. All right, so let's rewrite that limit. So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6.
All right. And then uh, when we expand the numerator, so let's do that. So the n times n plus 1, let's just multiply that first. So that's going to be n squared plus n times 2n plus 1 over 6. And then we'll multiply these two in the next step. So that's going to be 2n cubed plus, n, uh, plus 3n squared plus n over 6. And then I want to move this n cubed in. So I'm just going to do that here. And now what do we see? This is actually something we worked with when we talked about limits. It's a polynomial over a polynomial. And they have the same degree, which means that the limit is just going to be uh, the ratio of these leading coefficients. So that's going to be 2 over 6, which is 1 third. And so it turns out that this area of the curve one over uh, of the curve of x squared between zero and one, this area is one third. So that was a lot of work to find the area. So now we're going to learn a nicer way to do it, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's uh, talk about that. There are two parts to the fundamental theorem of calculus, and honestly, which ones which depends on who your teacher is. I uh, learned it one way in one class and then the next year it was flipped. So I'm just going to uh, show it to you one way, but just know if someone says the first fundamental theorem of calculus or the second fundamental theorem of calculus, they can be swapped. So I'm just going to start with the first one, the way I learned it, or sometimes part one. So this actually relates to having an antiderivative given by an integral. So what this is going to tell us, so suppose you have some function f, which is continuous. And it's important that it's continuous because otherwise the integral, the definite integral does not have to exist. All right, and then we're going to define this new function, capital F, so that capital F of X is the integral, the definite integral from some fixed point A to X of F of T dt. Then this tells you that F is differentiable and its derivative is little f. So capital F prime of x equals little f of x. And so basically, this is telling you if you're given this function f and it's continuous, then it has an antiderivative and it's given by this formula. And then part two is going to actually help you find the area. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And we're going to do some practice with this. So now uh, you're going to be given, uh, you have f of x, all right? And you're going to be given some antiderivative g of x. It can be any of the antiderivatives, even if they differ by a constant, it doesn't matter. And um, so basically that's just telling you that g prime of x equals f of x. Then uh, the integral, definite integral, from a to b, where a and b are some fixed numbers, of f of x dx is equal to g of b minus g of a. So you uh, take the indefinite integral, you evaluate it at the endpoints, and you subtract. And that's going to give you the definite integral. So let's go back to the example we just did. So what we just did was the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx. Well, let's try solving it this way. So what's an antiderivative of x squared? Well, we know that's x cubed over 3. 
So our g of x is going to be x cubed over 3. Um, and there would be a plus c, but in fact it won't matter because we're going to subtract it. And you'll see why. So in general, you don't need to keep a plus c here when you're working with a definite integral. So then uh, the answer is going to be this integral equals g of 1 minus g of 0. So g of 1 is going to be 1 cubed over 3 plus c, so 1 third plus c, minus g of 0. So g of 0 is just going to be 0 plus c. And the c's cancel, which is why in general we don't need to keep them. That'll always be the case. And we're just going to be left with our 1 third. And so that's a much simpler way to come up with the answer to this integral. So now we'll do some more practice. So here's an example. Say f of x equals 5x squared plus x. Find the area under the curve of f of x. from negative 3 to 2. All right, so let's do this. So this is asking for the integral from negative 3 to 2 of 5x squared plus x dx. So now let's find our antiderivative. So this is going to be equal to 5x cubed over 3, 5x cubed over 3, plus uh, x squared over 2. And the and then we're going to take this, we're going to evaluate this f2, and then minus 3, and then subtract. So the shorthand way to write this is we put a bracket here just on the right, and we put the 2 and the minus 3. And this is telling us we're going to evaluate this at 2, and then evaluate this at minus 3, and then we're just going to subtract them. So let's do this. So first f2, this is going to give us 5 times 2 cubed over 3 plus 2 squared over 2 minus, all right, let's evaluate it minus 3. So 5 times minus 3 cubed over 3 plus uh, minus 3 squared over 2. And then we can simplify this. So this looks like 40 over 3 plus 2, uh, the, this will still be negative. So I think this gives a plus 5 times 20. Uh, so this should be plus 45. Uh, and then this will be uh, overall positive, which means this minus sign makes that negative. So that looks like it's minus 9 over 2. And you can simplify this. So this would give us the final answer. All right, let's do another one. So let's say we're given h of x equal to 2e to the x minus 5x squared. And the graph, just a general picture, is going to look like this. And one thing you should know, if you're asked to find an integral and the sign is sometimes negative, so let's say we're going between some point here and some point here. So we're finding all this area, but not all of it is positive. So in this case, we're actually finding the signed area when we take an integral. And what that means is the part above the x-axis that adds to the integral, and then everything below subtracts from the integral. So for example, if we had something like this, where we had an even amount of part uh, of the graph below and above, then the total integral of this thing would actually end up being zero because the positive part is the same as the negative part. So don't, don't be surprised if you get like a smaller answer than you expected or even a negative answer. That's what uh, where it's coming from. All right, let's find the integral of this from zero to one. So find the integral from zero to one of h of x dx. I'll pause for a moment, see if you can work this out using the fundamental theorem of calculus.
All right, so let's talk about it. So the first thing we want is some antiderivative. So let's see. So e to the x, that doesn't change because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so the integral of e to the x is also e to the x. So this is just 2 e to the x. And then minus 5, um, the x squared gives us a term of x cubed over 3 when we integrate. And then we're going to uh, take this and we're going to go from 0 to 1. So we're going to evaluate at 1 and then at 0 and then we're going to just, just subtract. All right, so let's do that. So evaluating in 1, this is going to give us 2e e to the 1 is just e, minus 5 uh, times 1 third, so minus 5 thirds. And then we're going to subtract what we get when we evaluate at 0. So when we evaluate at 0, we're going to have 2e to the 0, which is just 2. And this term doesn't matter because it's 0 and x is 0. So we're just subtracting 2. And so we're going to be left with 2e uh, minus 2 uh, minus 5 thirds. And that's the final answer. Um, you can simplify and get a decimal from this, but e is irrational, so you're not going to get much better than that. All right, let's do another example to practice. So let's say g of t is equal to 5 over t plus uh, sine t. And we want to find the integral from, let's go from negative 1 to 1. No, actually, let's not do that because there's a t in the denominator, so we don't want to get too close to zero. Let's um, let's go from one to two of g of t dt. So again, I'll just pause for a moment and see if you can solve it. All right, let's work this out. So um, I'm going to just do both of these separately just to demonstrate that that's also allowed with a definite integral. So we're just going to separately do the integral from 1 to 2 of 5 over t dt. And then we're going to do the integral from 1 to 2 of sine t dt. OK, so um, Let's start with the first one. So this is going to be equal to, and I'll just use some different colors uh, so we know which one we're doing. So what's the antiderivative of 5 over t? Well, it's 5 times 1 over t. And the antiderivative of 1 over t is the natural log of t. So this is going to be 5 ln t from uh, 1 to 2. And so that's going to be 5 times the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 1. And the natural log of 1 is 0 because e of the 0 equals 1. So I'm just going to get rid of that. And this gives us just 5 times the natural log of 2. And that doesn't really simplify, so I'm just going to leave it as is. Now let's do the other one. So this is the integral from 1 to 2 of sine t dt. So what's an antiderivative of sine? Well, uh, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So negative cosine is going to be an antiderivative here. So we're going to have negative cosine t, again, going from 1 to 2. So that's uh, negative cosine 2 plus, because we're subtracting twice now, plus cosine of 1. 
All right, and uh, we're just going to actually leave this as is because this is like cosine of two radians and cosine of one radian. So if uh, they're not like multiples of pi, it's, uh, we can't really simplify that further without just getting a decimal approximation. So we're just going to leave that as is, and then we're just going to add them to get our final answer, which is going to be five times the natural log of two minus cosine two plus cosine one. All right, so let's maybe do one more quick example. We can do maybe a simple one. Say we just have the graph of y equals x from 0 to 3. And so we want the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx. Uh, so we'll work this out using the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then we'll also just find the area and we'll see how it gives us the exact same formula. All right, so what's an antiderivative? Well, uh, x um, is x to the 1, so that's going to give us x squared over 2 from 0 to 3, which is just 3 squared over 2 minus 0, so that's 9 halves. Well, we can also find this area the same way. It's just a triangle. The side length here is 3, and the side length here is also 3, right? This is the point 3 comma 3. And we just multiply base times height divided by 2, and that also just gives us 9 halves. Just a simple example, just to see that it does, in fact, give the answer you would expect if the shape is something you can work with directly. All right, so that's it for today. And uh, today, we when we did Riemann sums, we just did one example where we actually took the limit and used that to find the integral. So you're not usually going to be asked to do that on the AP exam. What you will be asked to do is look for an approximation using a Riemann sum. So they're going to tell you maybe take this function and break it into um, four rectangles and then find the left Riemann sum. And what you're going to have to do is break it up like this and then add up those areas of those rectangles. And we won't be taking the limit, then we'll just be adding them and getting an approximation. So this is what we'll be working on next time. And that's it for today.